Hello again. We welcome you back to Discovering Revelation, where we are discovering the prophecies of the last book in the Bible, along with other parts of Scripture that deal with prophecy. Let's begin with just a short prayer, and then we'll do our quiz. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together again to study your word. We pray your blessing on every viewer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for the quiz? Five questions from last night. Not our last lecture, which was this morning. This is from last night's lecture. Modern prophets, visions, and dreams. Take out a piece of paper, post-it note or something, and a pen. And we're going to do five questions as a review. First question, there are many false prophets. Therefore, there must also be a genuine gift of prophecy. Is that true or false? There are many false prophets. Therefore, there must also be a genuine gift of prophecy. Question two is a yes or no. Was the gift of prophecy to always remain in God's church? Yes or no, was the gift of prophecy to always remain in God's church? Question three is a question. Why do most churches not have the gift of prophecy today? You have to write an answer. It's not just true or false. Why do most churches not have the gift of prophecy today? If you didn't watch that previous lecture, then you'll just have to guess. Question number four. Is it yes or no? According to the Bible, can both men and women be prophets? According to the Bible, can both men and women be prophets? And then number five, the only way to identify a true prophet from the false ones is to check everything they write or say by the Bible test alone. Is that true or false? The only way to identify a true prophet from the false ones is to check everything they write or say by the Bible tests alone. Now let's go back through and you can check and see if you got them all right. Question number one, there are many false prophets, therefore there must also be a genuine gift of prophecy. What's the answer? It is true. Question two, was the gift of prophecy to always remain in God's church? The answer, yes. Question three, why do most churches not have the gift of prophecy today? Because they are not keeping God's law, or at least not all of God's law. Question four, according to the Bible, can both men and women be prophets? The answer, yes. And number five, the only way to identify a true prophet from the false ones is to check everything they write or say by the Bible test alone. The answer is, of course, true. I hope you got all five of them correct. And if you have questions for us, you can send your questions to discoveringrevelation at gmail.com. Now today we're going to study the 144,000. And your lesson that goes along with this study is this one, number 26, a love that transforms. So on our website, Revelations of Prophecy, just look for number 26. The title of the lecture is actually different from the title we're using here, but you look for that lesson 26 and you can download that right into your computer or your smartphone. Our next meeting tomorrow will be Mystery Babylon, Revelations, Scarlet Harlot. And we are inviting you to read ahead of time chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. We're going to find out Sunday why the retired Pope wears red shoes. That's going to be an interesting uh, discovery. Then on Monday, we'll study the Governor's Six Mysterious Mistakes, one of the most fascinating stories from history. You will enjoy our topic on Monday. Tuesday, Modern Magic, Miracles, and the Occult. How can you know whether a miracle is coming from God or the devil? Can the devil work miracles? I'm going to show you a video clip on Tuesday of what's happening in some churches in the name of religion. You'll be amazed. That's our study for Tuesday. Now we want to sing our theme song together. You can sing right along with us wherever you are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Bow your head with us for just a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we open your holy word, we pray you would open our hearts that we might see Jesus Turn our eyes upon Jesus as we've just sung. May we follow him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our topic for today is Revelation Saints and the 144,000. A common question that people ask when it comes to the book of Revelation is, who are the 144,000? You can read about the 144,000 in Revelation 7, and in Revelation 14, there you find this special group specifically mentioned. Let's begin with Revelation 7. We're going to read verses 1 to 4. If you're taking notes, you can mark that. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 4 says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. We studied about the seal of God already in our lecture series. Then verse 4 says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So there's that number, a hundred and forty-four thousand. The first question we want to answer in our study, is the hundred and forty-four thousand the only ones to be saved, or will there be more than that? We find the answer in the same chapter just a few verses later. Revelation 7 verse 9 says, After this, after seeing the special group, the 144,000, after this, John says, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So there will be more than 144,000 saved. If you're not in that special group, then you want to be in this other group, which is so big, nobody can even count it. But the question for us, who are the 144,000? There's been plenty of speculation, and there still is plenty of speculation as to who they are. Some say they're going to be literal Jews. Some say they're spiritual Jews. Today, rather than focusing on exactly who they are, we want to focus on their characteristics, their qualities, what they are like. Revelation 7 gives us the number, the 144,000. Revelation 14 describes their character. And that's what we want to focus on in our study today, the character of the 144,000. So now we're going to Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5, to see what they're like. Revelation 14, 1 through 5 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. This must be in heaven. And with him, there's the group, an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. In the Bible, God's name is a sign of his character. When you talk about God's name, we know God is holy, God is pure. So God's name denotes his character. And these people have God's name in their foreheads. That's the frontal lobe. So they are pure in thought, pure in character, pure in doctrine. We'll put then as our first quality of the 144,000, they are godlike or Christ-like in character because they have the Father's name written in their foreheads. These people are godlike in thought, they're godlike in motive. Listen. If you want to be godlike in your actions, you have to start here. 
It has to come from the thought. We must be godlike in our thoughts. Holy living comes from holy thinking. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, speaking of the mind, for they shall see God. Would you like to see God? We know the 144,000 will. We want to be with them, or at least in that other number that nobody can count. And to be with them in that other group, we have to be pure in heart to see God. As the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinketh in his heart. Don't think here. You think here. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So these 144,000, they are pure in their thoughts. God-like in thought, they are pure in thought. Holy living is only possible through holy thinking. Let's read on the description of these people. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Probably because this is this, they go through a special experience so that's why no one else can sing their song. And then it says, these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins. That doesn't mean these are 144,000 celibate men, but rather these people are pure, like a virgin. They are not only pure in thought, but they're pure in their actions. These are they, which notice something else here about them. They follow the Lamb where, whithersoever or wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile. These are not gossipers. <laughs> For they are without fault before the throne of God. So you notice several things about this group, the 144,000. They have the Father's name written in their foreheads. That means they are godlike in thought. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are pure in action as well as in thinking. So we're going to put that as our next quality of this group. They're, first of all, pure in thought. Secondly, they are virgins. They have no fault, which means they are pure in their actions. They're pure in their lifestyle. They're pure in their doctrines. Purity of thought produces purity of action. They are virgins, symbolic of how pure they are in their lives. Not just their thinking, but their actions. And then it says they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So we'll put that as our third quality of this group. They follow Jesus wherever He goes. Now one thing is obvious. We, to be there in heaven, need to have similar qualities to the 144,000. We want to be in heaven. I think everybody wants that. We might not make it into that special group, but we can certainly be in that other group, which nobody can count. But to be in heaven, we need these qualities. Purity of thought. Purity of action. The virgins, they are pure in their lives. And then we must follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now, I have a question. When do the 144,000 learn to follow the Lamb? Did they learn that up in heaven or did they learn that here on earth? I think we could safely conclude that in order to follow the lamb there, we must learn to follow him here. If we don't follow the lamb here, we'll never follow him up there. The 144,000, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. They learn to do that here and we want to learn to do that here as well. And that brings me to my next question. Would you like to follow the Lamb? Would you like to follow Jesus? What does it take to follow Jesus? I'm going to give you the answer directly from Jesus Himself. Luke 9, verse 23. You'll want this in your notes. Jesus said, He said to them all, If any man will come after me, if you want to follow me, Jesus says, let him deny himself. Is that easy? No. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You want to follow Jesus? Then to do that, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross. 
you recognize that cross Jesus is referring to is not some outward sign or symbol we wear around our neck. But rather it's the cross of self-denial to do that thing I don't want to do, but God's word shows me I should do. Or to give up that thing that I like, but God's word forbids. I have to deny myself, take up my cross. You see what a lot of Christians today are looking for. They're looking for a cross that's easy to carry, a styrofoam cross that's padded. <laughs> Doesn't cost any self-denial. If you're going to follow Jesus, the 144,000, they do, and we do, we must too if we want to go to heaven. Then we have to deny ourselves. Did Jesus deny himself? Oh, yes, he denied himself to the point of giving up his life. And if we want to follow him, he says it's going to cost us self-denial. Notice another text. Jesus says this in Luke 14, verse 33. He says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not how much? All that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Obviously, the 144,000, they have been willing to give up anything or everything for Jesus. And we, if we want to be in heaven, we must also be willing to give up anything or everything that stands between us and Jesus. Whatever that may be, whether it's our family, our job, our bad habit, what, anything that stands between us and Jesus, we must be willing to give it up. Even if it costs us everything, ask yourself this question. Is there anything I'm unwilling to give up for Jesus? That's a serious question. You see what many people today are looking for. They're looking for a cheap religion, a religion that has no restrictions. That would be sort of like a marriage with no restrictions. Is there such a thing? No, that's not called marriage. That's called, uh, what do they call it? Shacking up? Common law? Marriage is restrictive. Listen, if restrictions take away our happiness, then marriage ought to be the most miserable thing in the world, right? <laughs> I mean, you've been to weddings probably, and there they are, giving away all their freedoms, vowing, all, you know, you listen to the vows they make to one another, that sounds pretty restrictive, and all the time, what are they doing? Smiling. Huh. How could they do that, give away all their freedoms and be happy at the same time? Why? Oh, love. Hmm. Now, don't miss this. There's nothing more miserable than two people married together who no longer love each other. That's misery. And it's the same spiritually. There's nothing more miserable than a Christian that's trying to follow all the requirements of the Bible that doesn't love Jesus supremely. And all they can see are the do's and the don'ts. I can't eat this and I can't smoke that and I can't drink the other thing and I got to go to church on Saturday and got to pay tithe. And this religion is so restrictive. The problem is not the restrictions of the Bible. The problem is... They don't love Jesus supremely. When we love Jesus with all our hearts, the requirements of the Bible are easy. The question for somebody who loves Jesus is not what do I want. The question is what does he want? What pleases him? I want to follow him. That's why the Bible says in John 14, 15, Jesus says, read with me, if you love me, keep my commandments. Listen, if you don't love Jesus, don't even try keeping the commandments. You just make yourself miserable and everybody around you miserable. But when you love Jesus, it's easy. In fact, when you love Jesus, you're going to go beyond the Ten Commandments. Let me prove this to you from the Bible. We're reading from 1 John 3, verse 22. The Bible says in 1 John 3, verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments. That's one thing. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We would conclude that the 144,000, definitely, they do what is pleasing in the sight of Jesus. And we, to be with them in heaven, we too must do what is pleasing to Jesus. For the true Christian, it's not just the Ten Commandments. They take the Bible and say, what else does God want me to do? I want to please Jesus. Because I love him. You see, the problem in the Christian world today is that many Christians are trying to love Jesus and love the world too. 
which really is not possible. Jesus says you cannot serve God in mammon. But there are many Christians that are trying. They got one foot in the church and the other foot in the world. And usually they're miserable people because they have a divided heart. Let's notice that we can't really love both. We're going to read from 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Put that in your notes today. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So we can't love the world and love Jesus too. When we talk about the world, we're talking about the vices of the world, the sins of the world, the addictions of the world that we as Christians know we should not be involved with. Those things the world does for fun. We usually call them sin, all those vices that the world practices. Here's another text you can add to your notes. This is from James. James 4 verse 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, James is speaking spiritually here. Know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the, a friend of the world <laughs> is what? Is the enemy of God. Now I have to ask you, would you like to overcome the world and its sins and be the friend of God? How many want to be, do that? <laughs> Yeah, we have to overcome the world. The 144,000 clearly have overcome the world. They are pure in thought. They're pure in action. They are following Jesus. And we want to be with them. So those are things we must gain as well. We have to gain the victory over the world. John lists three areas of the world that we must overcome. Let's look at these three areas. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, there's one thing, and the lust of the eyes, there's a second thing, and the pride of life, there's a third thing, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So here we have three things that we must overcome if we want to be with the 144,000 in glory. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we're going to look at these three in our study today. And we're actually going to take them in reverse order. And you'll see later why we do this. We're going to begin with that last one, the pride of life. John says that this is one of the things we have to gain the victory over. The pride of life is not of the Father. The 144,000 have the Father's name in their foreheads. The pride of life is not of the Father. So we must gain the victory over the pride of life. Very little is being said today about the issue of pride. And yet pride is a sin that God especially hates. It's probably in all of our natures. It was pride that caused Lucifer to rebel against God in heaven. And we'll never gain the victory over pride in our own lives until we surrender fully to Jesus. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The 144,000, they have the Father's name, His character in their foreheads. The mind of Jesus, you know, the Bible says He humbled Himself. That's the opposite of pride. And that's the kind of mind we must have if we want to be in glory, following the Lamb wherever He goes. So we're going to look here at this number three, the pride of life. And I'm going to look at a specific area of the pride of life. This is an area virtually all churches and preachers used to talk about. But you hardly ever hear any sermons on pride these days, and you can understand why. We're going to look at a specific area of the display of pride, and that's the area of colorful cosmetics and jewelry. Now, before you get mad at me, let me just read you a question. Somebody actually wrote in the question. Pastor, is applying nail polish or putting on rings, necklaces good, not good as a Christian? And then I had another question somebody wrote in. Should a Christian woman wear jewelry? What does the Bible say? Is this an issue of pride? Well, notice the statement here from a magazine. This is the magazine Jewels, Fashion, and Pride. 
Mostly women are fond of jewels as fashion and pride. So yes, this is an, a display of pride. And I want to clarify, this topic is not just for ladies. Have you noticed how more and more men are wearing jewelry? I mean, take a look at these guys. <laughs> I heard one preacher say, if there's nothing wrong with a ring in the ear, what's wrong with a bone in the nose? Listen, if I were to preach to you this presentation, Discovering Revelation, and I had a bar in my nose, what would you think of me as a preacher? <laughs> People do notice what we wear. Now, please, we're not here to criticize or condemn anybody. You may have never thought about the wearing of jewelry, whether that's pleasing or displeasing to Jesus. And that's the question we want to answer. Is this pleasing or displeasing to Jesus? The true Christian wants to please Jesus. What does the Bible say on this subject? Well, here are a few texts, and this is not all of them. We're not going to read all of these, by the way, but you can put them in your notes. Genesis 35, 2 to 4. Exodus 33, 4 to 6. Hosea 2, 13. Isaiah 3, 16 through 21. 1 Timothy 2, 9. And 1 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. All of these texts make it very clear that God does not want us to wear jewelry. And I want to look up a couple of these texts. If you didn't get them all written down, no problem. You're going to see this slide several times, these texts. Let's look up this one, Genesis 35, verses 2 to 4. Here's what the Bible says. Genesis 35, 2 to 4, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. The family of Jacob had fallen into idolatry and sin, and so Jacob is now calling the family to revival and repentance. Let's read the next verse. And let us arise and go up to Bethel. They're going to take the family back to Bethel and rededicate the family to God. And I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Now you might be wondering, what were those strange gods that they were to put away? Let's read the next verse. Verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. That's those things we wear in our hand, on our fingers. And all their earrings, which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. So before rededicating themselves to God, they took off their jewelry. The Bible makes that very clear. And notice they were actually called strange gods. And if you trace the history of jewelry, you'll find out most of it came from the gods they would worship. They had little things that they would wear, symbolic of those gods. I know that might not be why we wear them, but that's where it originated from. Let's look at another one of these verses <clears throat> on our list. We're going to look at Isaiah 3, verses 16 through 21. Actually, we won't read that text, but you can put that in your notes. That particular passage has a long list of jewelry. It talks about rings, talks about necklaces, talks about bracelets, all sorts of things. In fact, it even talks about nose jewels. When I was in India some years ago, I was amazed to see how popular the nose jewel was. You would see women with a nose jewel on each side of their nostril. I learned while I was there in India that the nose jewel for the Indians was a symbol of marriage. But nose jewels have become popular even here in Western countries. You have probably seen people like this with the nose jewel. It's becoming more and more uh, fashionable. Uh, take a look at these guys. Hmm. I mean, they're putting jewelry today in places we can't even talk about in a Christian meeting like this. What does God think about all this? Listen, God knew how many holes you need in your body. <laughs> the Bible actually tells us we should not make any cuttings in our flesh. But what does God think of all this? If you'd like the answer, you can write down in your notes Isaiah 4 verse 4. After describing all that jewelry that they were wearing in chapter 3, verse four, chapter 4, verse 4 says, God calls all that stuff filth. Apparently, God likes us best the way he made us. If you'd like a text talking about the wearing of cosmetics, you can put in your notes 2 Kings 9, verse 30. Cosmetics can be traced back to Jezebel one of the most wicked women in the Bible. 
you'd like to know where that came from. Now, I've had ladies tell me, but pastor, if I don't wear that stuff, I don't feel very beautiful. Well, let me ask you, ladies, should our beauty come from what we put on? Or rather, should it come from within, having Christ within the heart? That's where true beauty comes from. Maybe I could illustrate this way. Let's imagine that a master painter were to show me a beautiful painting and say, Pastor Lowell, what do you think of my painting? I say, well, mm, that's okay, but I think I can improve it. So I get myself some red paint. I put a splash of red paint here, a dash of blue paint there. I poke a hole in the picture. I hang a jewel off the, out of the hole. I say, now it's really pretty. <laughs> what have I done? I have ruined his painting. I think you understand my illustration. God likes you best the way he made you. You don't need all that stuff on to make yourself more beautiful. You look beautiful really the way you are. That's the way God likes you. I tell ladies, you're pretty without all the paint. You look more natural, more like you. Your smile comes through better. If you'd like a New Testament text, let's look at a New Testament text now. We talked about some of these Old Testament ones. Here's one from the New Testament. First Timothy 2, verse 9. Paul says, 1 Timothy 2, 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, modest clothes, in shamefacedness and sobriety, this is the opposite of pride, not with broidered hair, that's when they used to weave gold into the hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. So Paul says we're not to be wearing that stuff, all the gold, the jewels, the pearls. Now that brings me to this question. How much of not is okay with God? I mean, it's just a little, people say, oh, but I mind, it's just a little earring. I just have one ring. I just have a small ring. How much of not is okay with God? Not is not, right? <laughs> While we're talking about the wearing of gold, perhaps we should answer another question. Somebody actually wrote this in. I saved it for here because this is where it fits. Somebody wrote in the question. I noticed that you didn't, don't wear a wedding ring. Is this a personal choice or a religious command? And yes, you can see I don't have a wedding ring on. I'm happily married. We've been, my wife and I have been happily married for 32 years. We had a ringless wedding. And now, before I answer that question, why I don't wear one, let me ask you, will a wedding ring keep two people faithful to each other? Obviously not, otherwise we wouldn't have all these broken homes, all these divorces, all these uh, affairs. A wedding ring is not much protection in this modern world of ours. In fact, notice I found this recently from, I was doing some research on wedding rings. Wedding bands for women, this is a website selling them. Why is a wedding ring more of a deterrent for women than men? And the article said this, when a man sees a wedding band on a woman's finger, it's like a magnet. In other words, for men, seeing that ring does not mean a thing. If anything, it makes a woman more appealing. <laughs> and the article was going on to say, you know, people, men are looking for women that are already being taken care of, provided for by somebody else. They just want to have fun. But they don't want to provide. So they look for a woman with a ring on. Well, that's on one side. Here's the other side. This is MSN News. Beware the husband hunter. Why some women go for guys who are taken. A sparkly engagement ring used to be the symbol of ultimate security for single girls. However, a dangerous ilk or trend of women is on the rise. Those who don't consider a wedding band a deterrent when searching for Mr. Right. So you can see a wedding ring is not much defense these days. I've had men say, well, I want my wife to wear a wedding ring for protection. Huh? Husband, if you want to protect your wife, don't buy her a wedding ring. Buy her a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler. We recognize a wedding ring is not much protection. Incidentally, our deportment is our best protection. Listen, a wife in a thigh-high miniskirt with her bosoms half uncovered, that is friendly with men, is going to get in trouble regardless of how big her wedding ring is. 
But a wife that dresses modestly, that has a modest demeanor, she's going to avoid many advances. Our deportment is our best protection. But let me answer the question since somebody's asked me. Here is why I don't wear a wedding ring. Number one, rings are among the items listed as displeasing to God. Genesis 35 and Isaiah 3. Actually, they're called strange gods. Genesis 35. And then number two, God instructs us not to wear gold. And then number three, my example to others. If I were wearing a wedding ring, I wouldn't even talk about jewelry. You can understand it would be too inconsistent. Now, I'm not here to criticize anyone who's wearing a wedding ring. I'm simply answering why I don't wear one. That's a question you have to decide between you and your spouse. But as you consider that, I want you to consider this. What would be pleasing to Jesus? Ultimately, we want most to please Jesus. And when we put him first, we'll actually become a better spouse to whoever we're married to. Let me hasten away from that hot topic and on to another hot topic. And that is the wearing of modest apparel. You say, Pastor, well, you're pulling out all kinds of questions tonight. Yeah, somebody actually uh, wrote this in to me. Pastor, please talk about dress code, especially ladies. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's just especially for ladies, but here's what the Bible says. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. We ought to say a word about modesty. Here's what the dictionary itself, Oxford Dictionary, says about modesty of women. Dressing or behaving so as to avoid impropriety or indecency, especially to avoid attracting sexual attention. Modest. And then of clothing, not revealing or emphasizing the figure. Modest dress means that hemlines must be below the knee. I thought that was amazing. That's coming from the dictionary. This is not some dress code of some conservative church. The dictionary itself says hemlines must be below the knee. Amazing. You see, God asks us to be modest, especially for women, because men are affected differently than women. When a man sees a woman with not enough clothes on or with immodest clothes on, he's tempted. And that's just the way God made men. This was to heighten the joy of marriage. God did not intend for a man to look upon the nakedness of any other woman except his wife. But when a man sees a woman that's dressed immodestly, he's tempted. And that's exactly why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart, in his mind. And you probably have seen something like this. Here's a group of young men standing somewhere, street corner or somewhere. And along goes a young lady dressed in a mini, a mini skirt. What do those young men do? What are they thinking? They're not thinking about discovering revelation. <laughs> They're thinking lustful thoughts. Now, certainly no woman is going to want to dress herself up in such a way that every man that looks at her is going to be tempted to take a second and a third and a fourth look and start lusting after her. A Christian woman, woman wouldn't want to do that. The 144,000, they are virgins. They look like pure people. They're not dressing to, they say dressing to kill. Now, I know sometimes the ladies say, well, it's just that the men have, they have dirty minds. Well, the fact is every unconverted man has a dirty mind. And even converted men can be tempted. Right, men? I know, you won't dare answer that question with your wife sitting beside you or your sister. <laughs> I was doing meetings, meetings like this, in the Dominican Republic. And you understand it's hot down there, not like it is here in Colorado. It's hot down there. And because of the heat... Many women down there, they dress uh, to stay cool. They won't wear a bra, it's too hot. So they come along with you know, no bra on. They're wearing these tight t-shirts, I guess to hold things together, whatever. And they're usually low-necked. So I go down there to preach the gospel. And I'm looking out over the audience, and here's some half-uncovered bosoms beaming back at me. I say, Lord, I can't look there. I look at the other side, and there's another pair. Look, I say, Lord, I can't look there. I look back, there's another. I say, Lord, where am I supposed to look? I suppose they probably wondered why I spent so much time looking at the ceiling, preaching over their heads. I tell ladies, have mercy. 
I remember one time I had a, a brother. He said to me, he said, he said, Pastor, I'm, I watch these religious programs on television. And he says, the women, they sit up there on the stage in these miniskirts. And he says, they're always pulling. They're trying to stretch those miniskirts. He says, Pastor, I'm tempted. Why don't they tell those women to put some clothes on? I said, well, I can understand. That's just the way God made men. Now, certainly, ladies, if you're a Christian, you want to dress in a way that's not going to be tempting men to sin. Now, please, we're not talking about dressing yourself up to your chin like the nuns or putting on a veil like the Islamic women. But listen, ladies, our clothing ought to be high enough on the top and long enough on the bottom and loose enough in certain other area, places to cover those parts of our anatomy that tempt men to sin. Amen? I know when I used to preach this in Africa, the men would say, Amen, preach it, come on, tell them, pastor. And the women are sitting there looking like, can we talk about something else? You say, pastor, you're picking on women. No, let me not, I'm not going to pick on just women. Well, look at this. Don't tell me, is that modest, gentlemen? When your pants are so tight you can see everything, that's not modest for men either. So for both men and women, there needs to be modesty. And you can see where, <laughs> where we are headed. Now they're putting men in skirts. That's a new trend now. Well, enough for that. That's the pride of life. The 144,000, they have gained the victory over the pride of life, and we must gain that victory also. Let's go back to number two now, the lust of the eyes. John said we must gain the victory over the lust of the eyes. That's not of the Father. We want to have the Father's name in our foreheads. The lust of the eyes is not of the Father, but of the world. When we look upon things that are impure, we have impure thoughts. The 144,000, they have pure thoughts. So the lust of the eyes. Let's talk about what we look at. You may have heard the saying, by beholding, we become changed. And that really is true. That's a principle. We become like what we behold. In fact, the Bible actually tells us that, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. If we behold Jesus, we will become like him. The 144,000, they obviously, they're following Jesus, beholding Jesus, and that's why they become like him in thought. So if I want to be like them, be with them, then I have to be careful what my eyes are viewing. Take, for example, the Internet. You've heard of our problem with pornography. 90% of 8 to 16-year-olds view pornography on the Internet. Most of them while they're doing homework. It has become a huge problem. In fact, notice what Dr. Zillman said about pornography. The negative effects of pornography have been more consistently proven than the links between smoking and lung cancer. It actually is a way to shrink the brain. And you might wonder why the women are getting so far ahead of the men in college now. In fact, I read a statistic where they say by 2068, the last man will get his degree. After that, men will no longer have the mental capacity to get a college degree. It's because they're squandering all their mental health and the vices that go along with pornography. Well, it's not just the Internet. Then there's the television. And you know what comes from Hollywood. Most of it is unfit to watch. By beholding, we become changed. Did you know by the age of 16, the average teenager has seen 200,000 acts of violence on television? By the age of 18, they have seen 50,000 murders or attempted murders. By beholding, we become chains. Can you see why people going to school, they come to school with a gun, they pull out their gun, they just start shooting people. We see it on television, they see it on the movies all the time. By beholding, we become changed. 80% of the sexual relationships on television are outside the marriage. Is it any wonder we have all this perversion and all this immorality in our modern world? By beholding, we become changed. Here's what the Bible says, Psalms 101, verse 2 and 3. The psalmist says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Tell me, what wicked thing could we put before our eyes in our house? 
and their television. Did you know the TV is found in the Bible? Let me show you. Psalms 119, 37, 38. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. You see the TV there in the text? T, turn away mine eyes from beholding. V, vanity. And here it says, establish thy servant in thy word. If I want to be established in the word of God, what should I do? Turn off the television and open the Bible. Ask yourself, where do I spend more time, with the TV or with the word of God? If you want to walk with 144,000, we need to be spending more time with the Bible and less time with that television. Television actually is bad to your health. Let me show you this. Every hour spent in front of the television per day brings with it an 11% greater risk of premature death from all causes and an 18% greater risk of dying from cardiovascular disease in new study finds. You might like to see the study. Here it's published in the, from the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. That's the insurance company. People who watch more than four hours a day the average is five, showed an 80% greater risk of death from cardiovascular disease and a 46% higher risk of all causes of death compared to those who watch less than two hours a day. Here's NPR News. I don't know if you listen to NPR. NPR News, watching TV could shorten your life. What if you're addicted? There's some people that are addicted to the television. They can't turn it off. They have invented a tool for the TV addict to break the addiction. It's called a hammer. <laughs> it actually works very well. My father-in-law, this is years ago, he bought a television. He had four daughters. This is probably 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago probably. And he saw, back then he saw the effects of television on the family. So one day, he took the television out to the garage, unplugged it, took it out to the garage. And then he began thinking, if I leave that thing in the garage, someday, somehow, it will migrate back into the house. My father-in-law is a builder. So he got himself his hammer. He went out to the television. <laughs> one blow was all it took. He went on after that to raise four wonderful daughters, and I got the best one. <laughs> Notice this statement. This is from Anton LaVey. Have you heard of him? He is the author of the Satanic Bible, founder of the Church of Satan. He said, Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new Satanic religion. Continuing, The TV set, or Satanic Family Altar, has grown more elaborate since the early 50s, a major religion of the masses. The TV, a major religion of the masses. Think about this. Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion, a satanic family altar. Do you have a satanic family altar in your home? Is your house a haunted house? You may have never thought about that. By beholding, we become changed. We need to consider what we are watching, the lust of the eyes. Well, we've looked at the pride of life. We've looked at the lust of the eyes. Let's back up now to number one, the lust of the flesh. John says we have to gain the victory over the lust of the flesh. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. This lust of the flesh, well, it might be painful. Have you ever gone to the doctor? Or the nurse, and they pull out this thing, and they say, this may hurt. Well, folks, this next part may hurt. This is a warning. Let's look at the lust of the flesh in a specific area, and that's the music of the world. Does the music of the world lead people to the lust of the flesh? Here is a statement from John Oates, the old Holler Oates rock band who said rock and roll is 99% sex. What's that? That's lust of the flesh. 
The 144,000, they're pure in thought. They're virgins. Well, here we have the opposite, the lust of the flesh. Now, you realize when it comes to the world's music, that's a very broad field. There, of course, was uh, rhythm and blues. Then there came jazz. Then came classic rock. Then came rock. Then hard rock. Then heavy metal. Of course, now we have reggae. We have hip hop. We have rap. We have western. We have country western. I remember walking into a truck stop one time. And the country western singer was singing, She makes my tractor sexy. I thought, wow, lust of the flesh. It all has that sensuous beat. Here's what Dr. Nedley said, Dr. Neil Nedley. Rock music listeners are more prone to use drugs and engage in extramarital sex. This is not purity like the 144,000. This is impurity. Heavy metal listeners are much more likely to consider suicide. Now, what's interesting, it doesn't necessarily matter what words you're using. It's the sensuous beat, the rhythm and beat. That's, you find it in all those styles of music, that, that beat, the sensuous beat. Here is something interesting. A choir singing religious rock was asked what effect this type of music had on them. The youth responded, it turns us on sexually, just like any other type of rock. Now tell me, is that going to be pure thinking? That kind of music does not lead to pureness of thought. It leads to evil thoughts, immoral thoughts, and then, of course, immoral actions. Here's what one pastor said. This is published in Blaze News. There is an intense war being waged today for the heart and soul of Bible-believing churches. This is pretty much all the churches. And one of the devil's most effective Trojan horses is music, he says. The music that has that sensuous rhythm and beat. It was the Beatles who said, now Beatle music, that's a long time ago. Our music is capable of causing emotional instability, disorganized behavior, rebellion, and even revolution. Beatle music? I've heard music in church with a stronger beat than Beatle music. Here's what uh, David Bowie said. Rock star David Bowie. Rock has always been the devil's music. Tell me, should a Christian listen to the devil's music? Should we bring the devil's music into church? We change the word, bring the devil's music in, we mix it with good words? I would say not. Here's what uh, Ellen White said about music. We studied about the spirit of prophecy a night or two ago. And some time ago, long ago, she actually wrote this. This is the book, Maranatha, page 234. The things you have described the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. So this would be very near the end of the world. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. So obviously this is something that's happening in church, church music. The Holy Spirit never, note that word, never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods of, for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival. And this is termed, this is called what? The Holy Spirit's working. What spirit is working? The powers of satanic agencies. So here it says there will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. Please notice. Here Ellen White is not describing what was happening at the disco. She's not describing what was happening in some holy roller, Pentecostal, charismatic church service. She's describing what she saw in vision would happen in some Seventh-day Adventist churches. So if you ever see it happening, you know we've been warned. Here is a statement from Richard Hodge, Hodges. 
in the book, Drum is the Year of God. During these rituals that still take place in the Congo and Yerba land, that's in Africa, the intricate layers of the multiple rhythmic drumming are considered the primary source of occultic power. <clears throat> A voodoo priestess from Brazil. You understand voodoo, that's the worship of the spirits. Christians would call that the worship of demons. This voodoo priestess said the rhythm is more important than the meaning of the words. The words really don't matter. It's the rhythm, the beat. Our gods respond to the rhythm among all else. Now, I want to give you an example of the rhythm mixed together with Christian words. Listen. Have you ever heard that one? There you have devil music, voodoo music, with Christian words. That was actually a children's music piece. And when you play that for the children, what are the children doing? They're dancing. They can't help it. The music makes you want to move. Well, that was the children's piece. Let me give you an adult piece. Again, you'll hear the voodoo music blended with Christian words. Those are Christian words, but that's rock and roll. That's rock music. What's amazing to me, the very same music I used to listen to 40 years ago when I was in the world. I told you my conversion story the other day. That same music that I used to smoke dope to, to get drunk to, that music has now come into the church. I say something's wrong when we're playing the world's music in church. We've changed the words, yes, but the music is the same. Here is what Little Richard said, rock musician, Little Richard. My belief about rock and roll is this. I believe this kind of music is demonic. A lot of the beats in music today are taken from voodoo. I was directed and commanded by another power, the power of darkness, the power of the devil, Satan. And we're mixing the devil's music together with Christian words today. Here is from a book, Demon Possession and Music, actually written by Dr. Juanita McElwain. She's a doctor of music, a professor of music. She said this, the exact same rhythms, note that the rhythms, are used in each of the three religions. What are those religions? In African and Indian music, I've been in both Africa and India. Yeah, they have those rhythms. In rock music, I used to be addicted to rock music before I was a Christian. And in music used in meetings of faith healers. The God, that's a demon, comes whenever he is called by anyone using those rhythms. Does the God, that would be a demon, come to celebration type worship services when the God's or the demon's rhythm is played in Christian rock music, even though the people present do not realize they're calling a God, that's with a little g, a demon? And this doctor of music says there's quite a strong consensus that the God, that's a demon, does come. We ought not to be inviting demons to our worship. We certainly don't want the devil in our house. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Nothing wrong with music. I love music. But let's leave the devil's beat, the beat of the street, out of our worship music. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. Here's what the Bible says in Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, the 144,000, they're pure in thought, pure in life. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. 
if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Obviously, the 144,000, they do all of this. They think on these things, and if we want to be with them, we must think on these things as well. If you'd like to learn more about music and how music affects your mood and affects your intellect, it affects your life, it affects your health, I would invite you to watch our series. It's on YouTube, Audio Invasion, The Unseen Enemy Within. We filmed that when we were in Africa, and you can look it up, AFCO Africa Audio Invasion. You can find, we did a whole series on music. You can watch it to learn more about music. We have today looked at all three areas of overcoming the world. We've talked about the lust of the flesh, the music of the world, which leads people to the sins of the flesh. We've talked about the lust of the eyes, the movies that we watch, the internet with all of its uh, perversions. And we've talked about the pride of life, what we wear and how we adorn ourselves. The 144,000, they overcome the world. They are pure in thought, pure in life. If you look at them, they look different. They look pure. They follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus, don't you? Notice what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people. It doesn't mean weird, but it means different. We ought to be different. A Christian ought to look different from the world. If the Christian dresses like the world, acts like the world, listens to the same music of the world, watches the same movies of the world, what's the difference? We know the 144,000, they look different. And we as Christians, if we want to be with them, we must be different. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The 144,000, they walk in the marvelous light of eternity in God's presence. They have learned here to follow the lamb wherever he goes. And friend, Jesus wants you to learn that same lesson, to follow him wherever he leads you. As you think about what we've studied today, I want you to think about Jesus and the sacrifice he made for you. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy that was set before him? What joy was that? It was the joy of seeing you saved. I can imagine as Jesus hung on that awful cross, dying that awful death, he could look down in his mind eye into the future and he saw people accepting his salvation. Perhaps he saw you. And he said, that man, that woman is going to give their heart and life fully to me. For that man, that woman, I laid down my life that they might have eternal life. That was the joy that was set before him, the joy of seeing you saved. And so the Bible says, take up your cross. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. And I want to appeal to you, whatever your cross is, usually it's a different cross for different people. What might be a cross for you might not be a cross for me. And what's a cross for me might be no problem for you. Different cross for different people. One of these things we looked at today might be your cross or it might be some other cross. I don't know. But I want to challenge you, friend. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Would you like to ask Jesus to help you do what is pleasing to him? How many want to ask him to do, help you do that? There is hope for you, but the world is your mortal foe. There is hope for you, do not its pleasures seek to know. There is hope for you, take up your cross and your Lord follow, because there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you who rock and roll reject. There is hope for you, the TV too, death our soul effect. There is hope for you, jewelry as well, we must reject, eject, but there is hope in Christ for you. 
We're going to end our study with just one stanza of that classic hymn, Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. If you know the song, sing along with us for this one stanza. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine, there's nothing between. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. You'll forgive me, it looks like I left out a few uh, slides there. Let's bow our heads as we end our meeting with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, this hymn is our prayer. We want nothing between our soul and the Savior. We want to walk with Jesus, with those 144,000 following him in heaven. Teach us how to follow Jesus here on earth. We ask that you would give each of us victory over the lust of the flesh, victory over the lust of the eyes, and victory over the pride of life. Help us to take up our cross and follow Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to download the lesson for this study. It's number 26, The Love That Transforms. You can get it from our website, revelationsofprophecy.com. And our next meeting, tune in again next time for Mystery Babylon, Revelation Scarlet Harlot. We'll be streaming that tomorrow night at 7. If you missed the stream, well, you can watch it later on YouTube. Until we meet again, friend, God bless you. See you next time.